everyone could everyone take their seats so we can get the panel started? Amazing panel. Um, we are going to be talking about autonomous vehicles. We have a very, very diverse panel here. I will introduce them. Uh, just give me one second. So we have Professor Irfan Issa, who um, is part of the School of Interactive Computing and the Associate Dean of the College of Computing at Georgia Tech. Um, Irfan has published over 150 scholarly articles, many in areas pertinent to the panel, um, including computer vision, machine learning, computational perception, and robotics. Um, we also have Ali Jamil, who is the CEO of TPL Holdings. Um, Ali has a strong belief in disruptive innovation, and to that end has spearheaded the growth of the asset tracking industry, used telematics data for better supply chain visibility, and introduced Pakistan's first digital mapping solution. Uh, we also have Joel here. He is the co-founder of Drive.ai, um, a company building the software brain of the self-driving car. Prior to working with Drive.ai, Joel worked on the self-driving teams uh, for several major automakers, including Nis Nissan and GM. Um, he was also a member of Stanford's Artificial Intelligence Lab, where he worked on deep learning for autonomous vehicle applications. Uh, last but not least, we have Lior Ron, who is the co-founder and president of Auto. Uh, Lior has been at the helm of some of the most exciting technology developments in the last decade. Prior to Auto, Lior was at Google, where among many other initiatives, he was a product lead for Google, Google Maps, helping to scale the business from 10 million users to 1 billion users. Um, Lior almost went to MIT for his MBA, um, but decided in the end to go to Stanford. Thankfully, not Harvard, otherwise we would have had a little bit of an issue getting him on this panel. So this is a very, very diverse panel here, um, solving problems related to autonomous vehicles, uh, both in the industry, around the world, and um, in, the, in, the academ in the academic environment. So um, let's start the discussion, and, and Joel, I'll point this to you, with the much talked about six level autonomous vehicle categorization. So you've been part of the automaker industry as well. Um, how, do you view the evolution of the autonomous vehicle as an incremental process, sort of guided by the scheme? Or is the industry poised to take on um, or, or get to a fully autonomous vehicle straight away? Uh, so I think the industry really needs to cross the chasm uh, between these assistive technologies that like uh, Emerg automatic emergency braking and ABS and things like that that uh, intervene in an emergency to level four autonomy where you can just sit back and the car does everything. And the reason for this is, uh, well, I used to work on level two, two and a half systems, let's say, at automakers, and uh, it, they do a great job uh, most of the time. Like, you can sit in the car and it'll drive itself down the road for hours at a time and it's great and you get really uh, comfortable very quickly, surprisingly quickly, even though like I knew I was, the car was driving under my own code and I should probably be a little bit wary about that, <laughs> but uh, it, it gets very, very comfortable, very easy, uh, very quickly. And uh, there was an instance where I was driving around testing and it was okay, this is on closed testing courses guys, so it's okay. Uh, and you get very lulled in this sense of security where yeah, you, you've been in the car and you trust it to keep going and then suddenly a goose shows up in the middle of the road and the car does not detect that, the radar doesn't see that, the cameras aren't designed to detect geese. So uh, I had to take over very quickly and uh, stop before I hit the thing. But uh, this is not something you can expect the average consumer to do. Uh, and the reaction time is incredibly variable depending on what that individual was doing before the system indicated that they needed to take over. So it creates this kind of uh, fuzzy area where the system is good enough to convince people that it can do a lot, but it is not good enough to protect the user from themselves, essentially, where the user gets 
distracted and takes themselves completely out of the driving situation and can't intervene when the system fails and these level two systems fail quickly and catastrophically uh, as opposed to uh, a gradual degradation of performance. So either it's working or you need to intervene right now. Couldn't agree more. The safest thing to do is to take the person and the driver out of the loop because once the person is in the loop, you just introduce all that variability. The comment I would like to make on the levels is we tend to think about the levels as some discrete magical events. When somebody hits level four, magic will happen and like unicorns will fly, but the reality, this is going to be a very continuous evolution um, of where those uh, cars or trucks or vehicles are going to be safe. Like the first level four uh, instance is going to happen maybe on some highway between 1 and 5 a.m. when there's no pedestrian and there's a wide shoulder on the side and between this exit and that exit. That will be mastered first. Then, uh, you know, that lane will be extended. Then it will be actually daytime. Then it will be with a bunch of objects uh, around. It's going to be a very gradual evolution until we actually see the technology widely available in every constraint environment and it's going to allow a lot of time to sort of evolve even within level four of when will that technology be safe. Right. Cool. So basically we need to build an ecosystem for, to reach level four or level five. So that's my next question and I'll direct this to Irfan. Um, what's sort of the state of the ecosystem technologically right now? Have we come up with a standard where it comes to sensing technologies or the use of deep learning versus a deterministic approach? What's sort of your sense of where we are right now? As an academic, my answer should be I hope not. Uh, because if we came up with standards, I would be out of my business. Uh, the bottom line here is I think there is a lot of great research going on. And actually, I'll put this in a context of something that was said in the previous panel. Uh, in technology, we actually build sensing technologies and actuation technologies, which we've been doing for a long time. And all of a sudden, we have a lot of data and actually capabilities of processing power to resolve this. But at the same time, a lot of other stuff has happened. And one of the things I always point to is, and people ask this question is, uh, with all of this technology, are we getting smarter? Yes, we are. I can ask everybody the question right now is, is Obama, what's the height of Obama right now? Almost all of you can find out really quickly. You didn't need to know this information. So that's what's happening with infrastructure and stuff like that in autonomous driving. We are actually slowly and slowly building an infrastructure because remember in the old days, cars were not driven on roads. They were actually something where dogs and, sorry, um, you know, donkeys and horse carts were. Now we're actually building roads and we're building infrastructure like, you know, uh, roads with markings. And it's those markings on the road that are actually helping us do a lot of autonomous driving. With the vision sensors, and also there are guardrails and stuff like that. So all of that infrastructure is kind of becoming what the sensor is picking up information from the environment. Yes, machine learning and deep learning types of things have actually changed the equation a little bit because no longer do we just have to give it a handset of features to do any of the analysis. We can start off with basically saying is go and explore. And then, of course, we have to annotate that information. We have to provide context as to what's going on. So the bottom line is, I think, while there is no standardization, except perhaps these levels, and I always enjoy it when these levels is something what us academics talk about in our departments and stuff like that, and they become industry standards. And everybody starts talking, oh, oh where are we with this? Sadly, and I agree with this, is there will not be a moment like Hal where one day a computer will wake up in 1996 and say, I'm an autonomous car driving. You know, there will be other types of events like this, and as a community that actually expands a lot of different types of people, that's going to include machine learning, computer vision people, and robotics people, are going to make different types of, prog of progresses in it. But I can sit down after anybody wants, we can talk about various real stuff that has happened in the last five years, and you can check mark those. And you check mark those, and you say, okay, that's where I am now because these things are not we're capable of doing. Um. Building up on that, I know Ali and I have talked about how the infrastructure needs to um, evolve, especially around the world, for autonomous to actually uh, take hold there. So can you speak a little bit about what w the work you're doing in that space um, that'll get us going around the world? Uh, yeah, so th this is a great discussion, right? When we, when we are in California, or you're in DC, or you're in London, or Germany, where there are roads, there are addresses, uh, there are streets, and you can just, you know, put it on a navigation system and you can just get there. 
And now with you know, AI uh, and driverless cars, you know, you're talking about level fours and level one and stuff. Uh, in the developing countries, um, at least the ones I'm involved in, there are about close to 700 million people in the industries where I'm involved, there is no remote address, right? You have to create the addresses. There are, there are the roads are there, but they're like 60%, 70%. So you have to improvise. Um, when you're doing your navigation or you're doing your points of interest or you're doing your databases, you have to improvise. So a lot of work needs to be done at that level. Uh, of course, what we're looking at now is essentially just in the, in the Western world, uh, but ideally, uh, any manufacturer would want to obviously be selling in those markets as well. So uh, I think this is kind of, uh, I think, on the back seat now maybe, uh, but a lot of work needs to be done on the infrastructure side, in the developing world at least. I meet a lot of uh, regulators and city officials uh, as part of my day job and um, they always ask what can we do on infrastructure and they're mm -hmm. always very disappointed to hear when I say uh, fix the potholes, paint the lanes. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite an achievement that we've tried to do in the US at least for the past 50 years um, that we haven't been successful at so let's actually do that. Um, I think in the developing world you need to do a lot of like heavy lifting to actually even get to that level, but in a developed world, the, my, my take on the V2V and V2I and a lot of that stuff, in the end of the day, the first autonomous car on the road will have to work without any infrastructure because you can't assume the infrastructure is there. So the hardest problem needs to be solved first. So since you need to solve the hardest problem first, massive infrastructure rollout after would be sort of helpful, but marginally helpful. You, we need to actually, all of us in the industry, need to sort of uh, solve this massive challenge with the existing infrastructure. So, so building up on that, then how, what is the, what are you working on specifically to get us there? I know you and I talked about how infrastructure is a big problem and the work you're doing at Drive.ai addresses that. Right, so there is the basic infrastructure where can I even drive a car safely with the potholes and the, yeah. the lane lines and things like that. But uh, if we actually want to scale this technology to work all over the nation and all over the world, uh, the current uh, back-end infrastructure for how self-driving cars operate, you know, you build up this uh, detailed HD map, you have a perfect idea of how the world is, and you go on like that, and you, it's kind of like a uh, these robot cars, you know, surprise, surprise, they act in a robotic fashion. Uh, but what we need to do to scale this quickly out to more areas is for these vehicles to be able to use the same information we have as drivers to, uh, to uh, navigate around. So that means we have sensors that perceive the world we see as, as it is now, and we have some vague idea of where to go from your navigation style maps, because, you know, you get lost anyway. So the, the work we're doing at Drive AI is uh, specifically focused on this area of how, how do we make this adaptable? How do we make this uh, technology work in areas where we don't have perfect information of how the world is right now a priority? And because these, these things change. Just in Mountain View, the roads have been changed, the lanes have been changed around. And if you're trying to maintain this massive uh, map infrastructure, um, I, I know uh, while he's working on getting that basic map infrastructure going, but as these, uh, these autonomous vehicles get uh, deployed in wider and wider regions, uh, this back-end map infrastructure is going to grow and grow to the point where it's going to be very difficult to maintain. And uh, I think the company that's going to be most successful in this space is the company that's able to expand faster and cheaper than, than others. So if this company can deploy in a new area, just with the information that you have as a driver, then they're gonna be able to operate in more areas, quicker, more jurisdictions, different countries. Uh, and I, I think that's how we're gonna get uh, these cars everywhere. That's how it's they're gonna be, become a ubiquitous technology instead of just a Silicon Valley bubble technology. So jumping into this one, and again, thinking through this is sometimes you have to adapt the technology or sometimes you have to adapt the user or the infrastructure. I mean, we could make it that no wild geese show up on roads by putting all kinds of barricades and having them shocked before they enter the road and stuff. I mean, we would have solved speech recognition ages ago if all of us spoke in Pig Latin. Because everybody has a nice pause and there's the same uh, you know, acronym at the end of all of the words. But you know, we can actually take those types of steps. We can put infrared markers on the road that humans don't see but cars can see. 
So we have to start asking ourselves the question is, how much are we going to adapt the environment and the user to provide the technology that actually we need, or are we going to really make it work in the wild where there are cows on the road and other types of things too? So we then have to really build not just a dog or a cat detector, perhaps a cow detector. And so you know, scaling those types of things up in the real world is one of the challenges we have to start thinking about in our infrastructure needs. I'm actually working on the cow detector. <laughs> It's, 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 it's not as fancy as it sounds, it's quite a simple technology. So it seems to me that a big piece of, of getting um, autonomous vehicles into the market today is actually uh, being able to test them in real world or near real world environments. Um, I read a MIT Tech Review article recently where uh, some research team in Germany was using uh, data from Grand Theft Auto as sort of the simulation data for testing their vehicles. Can you talk about, I know you, you're doing some pretty sophisticated testing um, for auto uh, trucks. Can you talk a little bit about? Yeah, I mean, in the end of the day, we're trying to teach those vehicles or those robots uh, how to drive like kids sort of getting their driver license. So the more we can accelerate that uh, uh, learning process, uh, the better. Um, so this is all about finding a way, as Joel mentioned, to scale uh, the learning as fast as possible um, in multi-level. So level one is really sort of observing and driving as many miles in the real world to really sort of understand what does that world uh, look like? What are the edge cases? What are the, uh, you know, cows or geese or goose or anything random that you will actually um, run to in the real world, and the benefit um, of being an Uber, you know, we have billions of those miles to potentially yeah. learn from um, and um, really uh, deduce from. And you take those learnings and you try to distill them in as much as possible to a simulation, and the Unity uh, founder was here before, and it's a great uh, tool, and Grand Theft Auto, basically using simulation at scale to learn as much of that in the computerized environment to uh, be able to um, learn much more efficiently. Plugging that real world data, the maps, the edge cases, the rare events into that simulation environment so we can learn as much as possible. And then in between trying to, on the test court, on a safe test course, uh, simulate the environment as much as we can. We have a pretty big test course in Pittsburgh as well as, well as Gomentum Station here um, in the Bay Area and trying to simulate all of those edge cases from pedestrians jumping into the road to occlusion to bad weather conditions to all of those edge cases that we can learn as much as possible on those. So it's really all of those three levels, combining them and then finding a way to both uh, test the mundane millions of millions of miles of mundane road conditions we need to actually make that safer but also finding a way to uh, inject all of those long, long, very long tail of edge cases into that environment so we can learn how to address those as fast as possible. Very cool. So it looks like we have a lot of audience questions. So I'm just going to jump right into a couple of them. Uh, they, they're upvoted, so I'm going to go with the top one here. Why are we concentrating on autonomous vehicles rather than network cooperative vehicles, like cloud-controlled vehicles? Uh, I would say cloud control vehicles uh, at the initial uh, stage. I mean, I'll start out with autonomous vehicles would be much easier if all vehicles were autonomous. Uh, if we had complete control over all vehicles on the road, this would be a much simpler problem. Uh, the issue is that we don't have that, like uh, the average, uh, the total fleet replacement rate for all vehicles on US roads is about 30 years. And you're not gonna re replace all the cars immediately. So you have to deal with real drivers, you have to deal with real pedestrians. And uh, in order to do that, uh, if you're cloud controlling these vehicles, now you need to think about latency and mm -hmm. sending the data back up and back down. I don't think uh, for, fine green control of how the vehicle drives. It can be done at a cloud basis. It has to be done locally. So the car itself has to, without 5G, without any data going back and forth, it has to make uh, at least uh, safe decisions by itself all the time. But you can still think of cloud control in terms of uh, like fleet deployment and managing where you're gonna have your vehicles stationed and everything. And I'm, I'm sure uh, Lior knows all about this kind of uh, large scale of fleet management type activity. I mean, before the concept of autonomous driving or smart cars, there's been a concept of smart highways, which has been around for a long time. 
uh, and it showed up you know, pretty much after the high, high Eisenhower highway system was invented, and there was a lot of literature on this one. And basically, I think what was said is correct, is that this is too dynamic of a setup, and you cannot just change an incomplete infrastructure to create an autonomous network that takes care of it, because the dynamics of the thing, and that leads back to another whole concept here, is while you can train on a variety of things, it's the anomalies, the unknowns that you want to deal with, and that's what makes it really challenging and interesting and hard. I'll do one more question. Um, I think I'll, I'll direct this one to you, Ali, since you know a little bit about insurance companies. So what will the future of car insurance companies with autonomous cars potentially make driving a much safer activity? Um, well, well if, um, if they're self-driving, then certainly, right? Uh, so I think... Um, our, the insur our insurance has also become, of course, much more standard. Uh, but the way things are today, uh, we can pretty much uh, predict to a dot uh, our insurance pricing uh, based on tags and, and based on people's driving patterns. Uh, and in just in, in, in the countries I operate in, uh, sorry, I keep mentioning that again just to put things in perspective. Um, we've reduced our claims ratio across the board by about 10%, uh, and that's a huge number. And uh, we are taking that and scaling that now um, to other regions as well. Um, and the way we price this is now, um, we go to an insurance company and we tell them this is the claims ratio. And with analytics that we're running, we tell them whatever we save, we'll actually charge you a percentage of that. Mm -hmm. And they're more than happy to give it to us. So. I encourage all of you to talk to the panelists in person um, after this panel, but unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you so much for, for being a part of this panel. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, while the panel is over.